Let's talk about the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. The Protestant Reformation began on October the 31st, 1517. When Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the church door of Wittenberg, Germany, spelling out his disagreements with the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church and simply calling for a public debate on these issues. Or, as one young person said in an essay that he turned into his teacher, according to Richard Letterer of Anguish, Len uh, Anguish English, Martin Luther was nailed to the church door at Wittenberg for selling papal indulgences. He died a horrible death being excommunicated by a bull. <laughs> but he found these 95 disagreements that he had on the church door, hoping that somebody would read them. They were in Latin and that they would uh, uh, debate him on the issue. People came up, translated them into German, a host of other European languages, and it spread like wildfire all over the continent of Europe. Now, bear in mind, only 25 years earlier, Columbus discovered America. That year, 1517, you need to know what's going on in the whole world. I mean, the people who watched Luther pound the theses on the door had no idea that this would be an, a history-changing event. In 1517, there were three young kings in Europe just beginning their careers. There was Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire in Germany, who was only 17. There was Francis I of France, who was only 23 years old. There was Henry VIII of England, who was only 26. If you know anything about church history, you'll know that all three of these men reigned for the next 20 years, fighting each other, befriending each other, but in each instant persecuting Christians. Charles V, whom you will see in uh, this uh, Luther movie, is responsible for the death of 30,000 Protestants. Francis I for others, Henry VIII for others. When, he, when Martin Luther pound his complaints on the door at Wittenberg, he was only 34 years old. John Knox, the great reformer of Scotland, was only 11 years old. John Calvin of Geneva was only 8 years old. Martin Bootser, the great Swiss reformer, was only 26, German reformer, was only 26 years old. And Zwingli was only 33. Now, what's the crucial importance of the Protestant Reformation? Why do we make such a big deal of it? Because it was the greatest event that occurred since the close of the biblical canon uh, at the end of the first century. The greatest, most important event to take place since the apostolic age during the days of Christ and just after his death. You could say that the Protestant Reformation is the greatest revolution in history since the very first century. It wasn't really a, a revolt so much as, the, as it was the reestablishment, the rediscovery and the reestablishment of the principles of the earliest, purest Christianity. The Protestant Reformation was a spirit-produced revival and reformation of the church and of society by the word of God. It was a revolution different from any other revolution before or since. All other revolutions are concerned with political changes. But what brought on this revolution was a love of the truth, a love of holiness, a love of God. You might say that the two greatest revolutions, the two greatest events in the past 2,000 years is apostolic Christianity of the first century and the Protestant Reformation of the sixth. Neither one of these great events and their effects were limited to one nation, but their influence extended over the whole world for generations and for centuries. In fact, apostolic Christianity of the first century and the Reformation are one and the same revolution brought about in different eras and under different circumstances. The first is the parent of the other. The Protestant Reformation wasn't trying to replace apostolic Christianity of the first century. The Protestant Reformation would have been nothing without apostolic Christianity of the first century. The Protestant Reformation has as its motivation and its goal the restoration of the purest form of biblical Christianity of the first century after it had been cluttered up and confused for the previous many, many centuries. My old professor, William, Ch uh, William Childs Robinson, who taught me at Columbia Seminary, 
and who was a godly man and a Calvinist, <clears throat> wrote a book that he called The Rediscovery of Grace. And if you can find that book and use bookstores, it's worth getting, because that is his summation of what the Protestant Reformation is all about. He said that which made the Protestant Reformation such a powerful vehicle of revival and reconstruction was that it was a rediscovery of God's grace and more basically a rediscovery of God himself as God had revealed himself in Holy Scripture. You know, whenever you want to get people to follow you and you want to make an impact upon people, uh, you do like uh, Newt Gingrich does. And that is you make sure that the speeches are full of sound bites. Because if you're like me and your sentence has several commas and semicolons in it, well, they're never going to interview you much on the news because they're not going to be able to get a complete sentence in in the 30 seconds that they have allotted to you. But Newt Gingrich is brilliant in that he's able to think out short little soundbite sentences, and so they're always quoting him. He might be right, he might be wrong, but he always says something to communicate what he believes. That's what they did in the, during the 16th century. These Protestant reformers had short, crisp, clear slogans and sound bites that set forth their message of the grace of God with unmistakable clarity and in a way that even the most common of people could not forget. So that God led his people to victory through the Protestant Reformation under these sound bites. Sola gratia. Sola Christo, Sola Cruce, Sola Fide, Soli Deo Gloria, and Sola Scriptura. Now those are sound bites. And each one of them catch the gist of the major emphases of the reformers. They knew about this long before New Gingrich was born. Sola Gratia, if you want to take notes, it's S O L A. G-R-A-T-I-A, two words, sola only, gratia, G-R-A-T-I-A. Sola means alone, Gra gratia means grace. And so the great emphasis of the Protestant Reformation is that our salvation and our standing with God is based upon God's sovereign, undeserved, unmerited, unearned grace alone and not on anything we do accomplish, contribute, or merit. As over against, as we'll see, the doctrines of Roman Catholicism. The second great standard is sola Christo, S-O-L-O, C-H-R-I-S-T-O. And that is that God's grace has accomplished our salvation by Christ alone. That God has worked out and finished the salvation of God of God's people throughout all eternity through the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. That there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved in the name of Jesus, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Sola gratia. Salvation's by grace and not by anything we do. Solo Christo. That salvation is to be found in Christ and in Christ alone. Sola cruce, S-O-L-A-C-R-U-C-E, by the cross alone. That the Lord Jesus Christ was our propitiation and on Calvary's cross he endured the punishment our sins deserve as our substitute. And by dying in our place propitiated the wrath of God. Turned away God's wrath and satisfied God's justice that we might be saved. Sola fide. S-O-L-A-F-I-D-E. Salvation is received by faith in Christ alone. Now let me tell you official Roman Catholic doctrine. After the Protestant Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church became worse than it ever had been before. And it made it impossible for itself to ever really change at heart. Unless it totally humiliates itself publicly before the world, which I pray that will happen. So at the Council of Trent, as a result of the Counter-Reformation, try to straighten up the church, at least superficially, so that the Reformers won't have any complaint against her. The Council of Trent, which today remains the official doctrinal statement of the Roman Catholic Church, says this in so many words, and this is almost a quote. It says, if anyone believes or teaches 
that salvation is by faith in Christ alone and not by the works of the law, let him be cursed to hell. Now, what was it the Protestant Reformation said? We're not saved by the sacraments. We're not saved by the church. We're not saved by the decrees of men. We're not saved by baptism. We're saved by God's grace, sola fide. You're going to see in the movie, Martin Luther write the word S-O-L-A out in the margin of a passage from the book of Hebrew, uh, Romans. You'll know what that word means now. Sola fide. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ alone and in nothing else. The reason the book of Galatians was written is because there were Judaizers who were plaguing the church who said that we're saved by faith and circumcision. And Paul says, if anybody comes preaching another gospel than the one I preach to you of salvation by faith alone, let him be accursed. Soli Deo Gloria. I'll never forget when I wrote that word, said that word in the former church that I served. There was an elder there who'd been going there all his life and they'd never had any distinctively reformed preaching that I'm aware of. And so I wrote the word Soli Deo Gloria. That's S-O-L-I-D-E-O-G-L-O-R-I-A. On a piece of paper, and I was going to teach the elders and deacons this phrase. And this man, who was a dear friend of mine, said, Joe, I know what that means. Solely is sun, solar. The sun always rises. <laughs> I said close, but no cigar. It's solely Deo Gloria is glory be to God alone. That the reason salvation is by grace through faith is that it cuts all ground out from human boasting. So that man has to give all glory, all honor, all credit to God for anything and everything good in his life. And then the last phrase is sola scriptura. S-O-L-A-S-C-R-I-P-T-U-R-A. And that is the only place where we can see and read the revealed will of God for us is Holy Scripture. That the Bible is the final, only, infallible Word of God, the source of all truth and ethics. Now that flies right in the face of the Roman Catholic Church. That says that though the Bible is the Word of God, it is one of a threefold source of truth and of ethics. So in Roman Catholicism, you have three sources of truth. You have the Bible, you have church tradition, that includes the decrees of the church and of the Pope, and you have reason, nature. And so that's why you don't have to get all your doctrines out of the Bible. You can get it from the decrees of the church or from reason. Over against that, the Protestant Reformation said, no, sola scriptura, that the Bible is a complete revelation of God. And all you need to understand life in this world and live life the way it was meant to be lived is in Holy Scripture. So you see those sound bites that the Reformers used that set Europe on fire. People could not forget them. Sola gratia, solo Christo, sola fide, soli deo gloria, sola scriptura. Or to put the gospel of the Reformation simply in one paragraph, as my professor William Childs Robinson did, here it is. Now this is distinctively reformed. Jesus did it all, all to him I owe. In my hand no price I bring, simply to his cross I cling. Here I hold because here I am held. Faith is simply the hand which grasps Christ and his righteousness. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, on the ground of Christ's righteousness alone, that God and God alone saves us. We supply nothing but the sinners to be saved. All the merit and all the praise for our salvation belongs to God, our sole and only Savior. This is the gospel freely offered in the Bible and brought to our hearts by the Holy Spirit through the preaching, teaching, and reading of the Word of God. Now, where did the Protestant Reformation take place? Everywhere all over Europe. You can study country after country and read thrilling stories. Martin Luther and his successor, Philip Melanchthon, were used of God to bring Reformation to Germany. William Farrell, Martin Bucer, John Calvin were used of God, as well as Zwingli, to bring Reformation to France and to Switzerland. John Rogers, Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley, Ridley, Thomas Cranmer, and the Puritans were used to bring Reformation to England. Patrick Hamilton, George Wissert, John Knox used of God to bring Reformation to Scotland. The Canons of Dort, the Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism established the Reformation in the Netherlands and Belgium.
John Alasco took the Reformation to Poland. Reinhardt, Towson, and Bergenhagen brought the Reformation to Denmark. Olaf and Lars Anderson took it to Sweden. The French Huguenots, Scottish Covenanters, English Puritans, Scotch-Irish Presbyterians, and German Lutherans brought it to America, from which land God has taken it around the world. And in the 16th century, reformers were found in Spain and in Italy and in Hungary. But I want us to spend the rest of our time this evening talking about the standard bearer of the Protestant Reformation, John Calvin. John Calvin's student and close friend for many years was a man named Theodore Beza, B-E-Z-A. And in 1564, the year of Calvin's death, his best friend wrote these words about him. He says concerning Calvin's life, I have been a witness of Calvin's life for 16 years. And I think I am fully entitled to say that in this man there was exhibited to all a most beautiful example of the life and the death of the Christian. We're going to divide Calvin's life into three or four sections, phases. The first phase, if you're taking notes, will be from 1509 to 1536. 1509 to 1536, which will entitle The Preparation and the Conversion of Calvin. 1509 to 1536, the preparation and conversion of Calvin. Calvin was born July the 10th, 1509, in Noyon, N-O-Y-O-N, France. He was trained and studied theology and law at the universities of Paris and Orleans. At those universities, he came in contact with several Protestant ideas through his professors. We don't know exactly when he was converted to Christ, but it was somewhere between the years 1533 and 1534. And in all of the massive volumes of Calvin, which number almost 60 volumes, he's so God-centered and so enamored with God that he only mentions his own conversion once, and that in one line, where he simply says, quote, By a sudden conversion, God subdued my heart to teachableness. Says it all, doesn't it? And in that one sentence, we see that the soul, the heart of Calvin's faith was absolute obedience of his intellect to the word of God and the total submission of his will to the will of God for the sake of Christ. When he was 26 years old, he wrote one of the two or three most important books ever to be written in the past 500 years. Twenty-six. He wrote in 1536 the first edition of his great work, The Institutes of the Christian Religion. He continued to edit and expand it all through his life up until 1559. And by the time he finally was satisfied with it at the end of his life, it was five times larger than his original work. But the theology hadn't changed. It had just expanded and matured. And so when he was 26 years old, he wrote the Institutes of the Christian Religion. The message of the Christian, of the Institutes of the Christian Religion, the word institute means fundamentals, of the Christian religion can be seen in the very first famous sentence that begins the book. He says, all our wisdom, insofar as it is held to be true and perfect, consists of two things. says, if you want to summarize everything that's worth knowing, we can distill it down to two things. And if you know these two things, you're a wise person. Namely, a right knowledge of God and a right knowledge of ourselves. He says, if you know God rightly and you know yourself rightly, you know about all there is you need to ever know says you can't know yourself until you know God. And you can't know God until you know yourself. And therefore both have to come by revelation. Throughout the years he expands, as we said, the institutes, perfects it, each time clarifying his purpose and his intention, changing the purpose for it. For instance, the first time he wrote the institutes in 1536, he simply said this is a handbook which comprises the sum total of the evangelical doctrine. That it was simply a manual for Christians on the basic fundamentals, simply put, of the Christian religion. 
But the more he expanded it, the more he wanted it not just to be a, a little handbook, but a preparation for the reading and preaching of the divine word, something the preachers could study and they could be trained in. And that by the time of his death, in 50, uh, b before his death, his last edition in 1559, he had as the Institutes, uh, the purpose of it was to express his faith, his theology, and his very heritage. Let me give you a quick outline of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Everybody ought to have them in your home, and not only have them, but read them. It's two volumes. These two volumes are divided into four books. Book one deals with God the Creator. Book two deals with God the Redeemer. Book three deals with the means of grace, how God accomplished salvation and how it's to be received. And book four reveals, uh, it talks about church and state. The basic fundamentals of the Christian life. Now memorize that real quick. I mean, you should know the outline of one of the two or three most important books in the past 500 years. Four books of the, in the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Book one on God the Creator. Deals with the authority of Scripture, the deity of, uh, of God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. The second book, God the Redeemer. The third book, The Means of Grace. Fourth, Church and State. You got it? Now, what's the influence of this book upon the 16th century England? Because you remember, that's what we're talking about. That's what this whole series is about, is about Christianity coming to the British Isles. And so I want us just to take a minute to show you how this Frenchman who wrote in French and Latin, pastoring churches in Switzerland and France, influenced an English-speaking country in the 16th century. Now remember, he died in 1564. Bear that in mind. He was at the peak of his life in the 1540s, but he had a lot of books to write after that. Okay? Bearing that in mind, let me tell you that before the end of the 1540s, long before this Frenchman who wrote in Latin and lived in Switzerland's death, his book, The Institutes, were being read, was being read and studied in England. We have records. 1543, a man translates part of the Institutes into English. 1548. Another man prints ten books of the Reformers, one of which from Calvin. In, in 1549, there was a book published in English called The Life and Communication of the Christian Man, which was simply a uh, translation of book three, part of book three of the Institutes of the Christian Religion. There was a Latin version of the Institutes that made its way into the uh, print, printing presses of England. And during the second half of Edward VI, the godly young king who followed Henry VIII, during the second half of Henry, Henry VI's reign, the Institutes of the Christian Religion had been one of the most popular works among English undergraduates in universities, especially at Cambridge University. Now, this is in the 1500s, already at Cambridge. They love and read in Calvin's Institutes. However, Edward VI dies young. Bloody Mary comes to the throne, as, as you would expect. She bans Calvin's books. In fact, there's all kinds of people who have to leave England who are Calvinists to keep from being killed by her. And so although Calvin's books are banned in England, these English-speaking people go to Frankfurt, uh, Strasbourg, uh, Geneva, where they themselves are able to study under Calvin and to read things like the Institutes of the Christian Religion. Then, praise God, Bloody Mary dies after five years. Queen Elizabeth comes to the throne, who was no... Protestant at all, and reigned for 45 years, during which time the Institutes of the Christian Religion became a dominant book, much used at both Oxford and Cambridge, and it was a deeply entrenched tradition in both these universities to teach Calvin's Institutes during the 45 years of the Elizabethan period. One man has said that the direct influence of the Institutes of the Christian Religion on education of preachers in England in the universities is incalculable. In May 1561, 1561, Calvin didn't die until 1564, his last edition of the Institutes, 1559. In May 1561, a full translation of Calvin's Institutes was published in London under the title, this ain't no soundbite. The Institution of Christian Religion, written in Latin by Master John Calvin and translated into English according to the author's last edition. That's the best-selling title. 
The man that did this was a man named Thomas Norton, who served as the secretary of Duke of Somerset, the Lord Protector of England, under the first half of the reign of Henry VIII, and who was a godly man. Thomas Norton, who was in correspondence with Calvin himself as he translated his book into English, was a thoroughgoing Protestant who married a daughter of the great Calvinistic Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, whose mother-in-law, the widow of Thomas Cranmer, was one of the people that underwrote the publishing of his book, and he was such an outspoken member of Parliament as a reformer that he was imprisoned in the Tower of London. His translation went through six editions just through the reign of Elizabeth alone. Another edition occurred during the reign of James I in 1611. This is it. The last, and then another in 1634, and the last time this book was ever published was in 1762. This book that I'm holding was published in 1611, the same year that uh, the King James Version made its appearance for the first time. This is what the elders gave me. You might want to see it. It'll cost you to touch it. 1611. So that shows you what a tremendous influence Calvin's writings had on England in the 16th century by all of the various editions of this book that came out. Now let's go to the second phase of Calvin's life. And that's 1536 to 1538. Not a long period. 1536 to 1538. And that's his first stay in Geneva, Switzerland. His first stay in Geneva, Switzerland. Calvin was satisfied to be a recluse scholar. That's what he wanted to do was some, find some peaceful place where he could read and study and write. And he would be happy all his life. But it never happened. There was an old reformer by the name of William Farrell, a fiery man who burned with zeal to advance Christ's kingdom. Who gave to Switzerland two things, to Geneva, Switzerland, two things for which Geneva has been known ever since. Protestant Reformation and John Calvin. He was convinced that Calvin needed to go to Geneva, that there was no man who could pastor the church as effectively in Geneva as John Calvin. And so he communicates to Calvin and threatens him with hellfire and the eternal curse of God if he doesn't take the church pastorate in Geneva. Threatened him with going to hell. Said, in effect, if you don't go to Geneva, you're going to go to hell when you die and I'm going to pray God's eternal curse on you. <laughs> Calvin was so shaken by the words of this fearless evangelist that he felt in his own words as if God from on high had stretched out his hand. Calvin went to Geneva. While he was at Geneva, one of the focuses of his life was the establishment of faithful church discipline in the church. Because Calvin believed the church discipline, along with the faithful preaching of the word of God, and the administration of the sacraments, are the mark of a true church. So he tried to establish weekly communion services, church discipline, the authority of the church to excommunicate, and freedom from state control for the church in Geneva. Here's his own words in defining what he wanted to do as the pastor of the church of Geneva. It is certain that a church cannot be called well-ordered and regulated unless it, in it the Holy Supper of our Lord is often celebrated and attended. And this with such good discipline that none dare to present himself at it save holily and with singular reverence. And for this reason, the discipline of excommunication by which those who are unwilling to govern themselves lovingly and in obedience to the word of God may be corrected is necessary in order to maintain the church in its integrity. Calvin was there two years, two or three, and uh, was at loggerheads with the city fathers. And in, in six, uh, 1538 was banished from Geneva. He, his church discipline was too strict, especially on the demands that he made for, for communion and baptism. And so because the, the city fathers were at odds with him and were, contra, and, and were opposing his attempt to faithfully discipline the church, Calvin and Farrell both refused to administer the Lord's Supper. And as a result, they were banished. Now, you need to know what was going on in Geneva at this time, why he was banished. I mean, here he was called a pastor of church in Geneva, Switzerland. During those days, there were two groups that took control of the council. The council was the, was the uh, municipal authorities that governed the city, the city-state. There were two groups. There were, first of all, and we'll use, these, use the English words, the patriots. 
The patriots aren't what you think. The patriots were secret Catholics, Roman Catholics, who spread rumors around that both Farrell and Calvin were French agents working toward the overthrow of Geneva. And so they constantly thought it was their duty to throw stones at Calvin's home. They got in control. Along with them were the libertines, or to use our words, the liberals. And the liberals were everything a liberal is today. They wanted complete freedom of conscience without any of the restraints of the word of God in worship and behavior and lifestyle. And they came control of the uh, city council. And so that led to his expulsion from Geneva. Phase three, 1538 to 1541. Got two more phases, this one and the last one. 1538 to 1541. This is the ministry of Calvin in Strasbourg. S-T-R-A-S-B-O-U-R-G. Unless you found it written differently in another book. Strasbourg, the ministry of Calvin at Strasbourg, 1538 to 1541. All right, Calvin went to Geneva. Now keep this in your mind. Born in France, trained in France, was a priest in France, a lawyer in France. God converted him. He became a minister of the gospel. Went to Geneva after Pharaoh threatened him with hell. Went to Geneva, got kicked out of Geneva for standing firm for church discipline, and became the pastor of people of a church in Strasbourg. While he was there in Strasbourg, he was under the influence, the powerful influence of a great reformer by the name of Martin Bucer, B-U-C-E-R, who's one of my favorite men in all of church history. While he was at Strasbourg, Calvin's ministry was multifaceted. I mean, unbelievable. Look at all the things he did. While he was at Strasbourg from 38 to 41, he was a pastor, a counselor, an author, a professor, a preacher, a traveling debater, a defender of Protestantism. And all of this is amazing in the light of the fact that he was a very feeble man plagued with a variety of serious illnesses. While he was at Strasbourg, he fell in love. He met, fell in love with, and married a woman by the name of Idolette de Bure, D-E, capital B-U-R-E. She was a widow of an Anabaptist leader, converted to the Reform branch. She died after nine years of marriage to Calvin, left no children of Calvin's own, except for those he himself adopted, which were hers by her previous marriage. A few years after her death, a, a, a few days after her death, they'd only been married nine years. A few days after her death, Calvin wrote this letter. Quote, Although the death of my wife has been exceedingly painful to me, yet I subdue my grief as well as I can. Had not a powerful self-control been vouchsafed to me, I could not have borne up so long. I have been bereaved of the best companion of my life. Of one who, had it been so ordered, would not only have been the willing sharer of my exile and poverty, but even of my death. During her life, she was the faithful helper of my ministry. She gave birth to a son at one time in their marriage, and that son died in infancy. And right after the death of this infant son, Calvin wrote, God has given me a little son and taken him away. But I have thousands of Christian uh, children. I have thousands of children in the whole Christian world. All right, the last phase of his life is 1541 to 1564. 1541 to 1564, the second stay in Geneva. So the first phase, birth preparation in France. Second phase, first stay in Geneva. Third phase, his ministry in Strasbourg after having get kicked out of Geneva the first time. And the last phase is the last years of his life, 1541 to 1564, his second stay at Geneva. All right, now he's been kicked out. The church fathers didn't want him. But then there was a powerful cardinal, Roman Catholic cardinal, by the name of Sadolet, S-A-D-O-L-E-T, who in 1540 treacherously invited the people of Geneva, Switzerland, to return to the Roman Catholic Church. So let's quit this feud. This is where you belong. Y'all have been misled. People have been jerking you around. You need to come on back home. We'll welcome you with open arms. And so he gave them very convincing and powerful arguments 
why the citizens of Geneva should come back into the arms of the Roman Catholic Church. People were considering it. The town fathers were scared to death. But no one in Geneva was competent to respond to and refute this brilliant letter of Cardinal Satellet. So, on October the 20th, 1540, the city council asked Calvin to come back. They promised him if he'd come back to Geneva, they'd use all the resources of this city-state to promote the Reformation and the glory of God if Calvin would just come back as the pastor of the church there. Although Calvin was reluctant to leave Strasbourg and return to Geneva, on November the 1st, 1540, he agreed to do so. But now, while Calvin and Farrell were out of Geneva in Strasbourg for those years, Geneva had fallen back into its old ways. Gambling, drunkenness, street brawls, adultery flourished. Lewd songs were publicly sung. Persons romped naked through the streets. Sounds like Atlanta. <laughs> but it had fallen back in its own ways. But during the time that Calvin and Farrell had been gone, God was at work in the city of Geneva as well to prepare it for Calvin's return. Of the four officials on the church, uh, on the city council who were taking the lead in the movement to banish Farrell and Calvin, one was condemned to death for murder, another was condemned to death for forgery, a third was condemned to death for treason, and a fourth died resisting arrest. God was at work in Geneva. Well, even though Calvin decided to come back and believe God was calling him to come back to Geneva, he couldn't stand the thoughts of returning to G Geneva, the city that mistreated him, stoned his house, harassed, harassed him, insulted him. In fact, we have a letter in which Calvin wrote Farrell. He says, quote, Whenever I call to mind the wretchedness of my life in Geneva, how can it not be but that my very soul must shudder at any proposal for my return? So in other words, he wasn't going there for his health. He went there after much negotiations, and so Geneva and Calvin have been joined together ever since. His life in Geneva, although incomparably useful in the Reformation of the Church, was a hard and difficult life. Listen to, his, uh, to this by Otto Scott. Despite charges that he had grown wealthy, Calvin wrote that he did not possess one foot of land and had not enough money to buy one acre Calvin said in his own words, I am still using someone else's furniture. Neither the table at which we eat nor the bed on which we sleep is my own. In fact, the house in which he and his wife lived was owned by the city council. Moreover, his health was always bad. Cal uh, Calvin's physical condition makes painful reading. He had gout kidney stones, piles and hemorrhages. He couldn't ride on a horse. He suffered from tuberculosis. He had to be carried first on a chair and then on a litter. Even lying in bed was painful for him. Food was distasteful to him. And he complained that the taste, in his words, quote, the taste of wine is bitter, unquote. No wonder he began to pray for death. But in the midst of all that, his concern was the proper organization and the order of the Church of Almighty God in Geneva. So Calvin arrived in Geneva September the 13th, 1541. On that day, he was appointed chairman of the company of pastors and was instructed to compose a draft of organizational principles defining the mission, authority, and order of the church and defining the relationship of the church and state. Calvin did what he was told. He was given that commission on September 13th. September 26th, he gave the report to the town council. And November the 20th, 1541, his rec uh, recommendations were adopted for the church in Geneva. There were basically two. The church was to be organized in Geneva with four offices. <clears throat> there were to be ministers who had the responsibility of preaching the word of God and of administering the sacraments. There were to be doctors, that is, teachers, that were responsible for Christian education and instruction. 
There were to be elders who were responsible for the supervision of the doctrine and life of the members of the congregation. And there were to be deacons who were responsible for the care of the material and social needs of the members of the congregation. So what he sought for was a Presbyterian church and got it. The second great principle that he fought for and had approved was this, that although both church and state are accountable to God and his law, they were separate institutions with separate functions. The church was not to be under the state, but was to be under Christ the King. The purpose of the civil government was to administer justice. The purpose of the church was to administer grace, to preach the gospel. And you see, that was a revolutionary thought in those days, not only among the Roman Catholics, but also among many of the children of the Protestant Reformation as well, who could not imagine the church not being under the authority of either king, monarch, or parliament, or some branch of civil government. But Calvin said the church should not be under the state at all, but under Christ the king. The Council of Geneva gave in to Calvin, and so the church was established. Thus making, as Warfield said and assessed, says, now listen, thus making the church absolutely autonomous in its own spiritual sphere. In asking for this, Calvin was asking for something new in the Protestant world. In the fruits of that great victory, we have all had our part today in the 20th century. And every church in Protestant Christendom which enjoys today any liberty whatever owes it all to John Calvin. It, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, whatever. It was he who first asserted this liberty in his early man to their successors with the outpouring of their blood. And thus Calvin's great figure rises before us, not only in a true sense, the creator of the Protestant church, but the author of all the freedom the Protestant churches exercise in their spiritual sphere. Calvin also had a concern for social order. Calvin worked to establish the sole, total, and exclusive rule of the Lord Jesus Christ over all individuals, families, affairs, relationships, endeavors, enterprises, and institutions of Geneva and of all mankind. John Knox, who pastored an English-speaking church in Geneva for a while during Bloody Mary's reign, and who studied under Calvin, Describe Geneva during this period, this last phase of Calvin's life. He said concerning Geneva that it was, quote, the most perfect school of Christ that ever was in the earth since the days of the apostles. And I believe he was right. Calvin found Geneva full of immorality and anarchy, and he developed it into a well-ordered, prospering Christian community. Calvin also had a great concern for education. Calvin set up an academy at Geneva that was the intellectual center of the Protestant Reformation and the dispersed Calvinists from England all over the world, all over Europe. This academy of Calvin's was offered distinctively Christian education based on reform principles. Over 900 men from all over Europe enrolled the first year. And at least that num same number of refugees from France and England were educated in his schools. From this school, this Geneva Academy, where Calvin taught, preachers and evangelists were sent all over Europe and as far away as Brazil in the 16th century. Many of the graduates of this school were sent to France which was a dangerous mission because to be a reformed minister in a Roman Catholic nation was to be automatically guilty of treason, which was a capital crime. But in time, these Calvinistic graduates of, of Calvin's academy created networks of secret churches and congregations which sent information back to Geneva. Services held by these graduates were held in private homes behind heavily curtained windows, sometimes in barns and sometimes in fields, and the Protestant Reformation spread. Calvin faced and refuted opposition from three basic errors, uh, 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 from three basic sides. Three basic source of opposition to Calvin. Roman Catholic Church, the Libertines, and the Anabaptists. 
And it's important for us to understand how he dealt with all those and how they opposed the Protestant Reformation. First of all, the Libertines, or the Liberals. These were antinomian socialists. They had no love for the law of God. They worked toward revolution in Geneva against Calvin and were trying to work toward the overthrow of any Christian moral order. They weren't Christians in any stretch of the imagination. Calvin faced not just verbal assault, but bloodthirsty opposition from them. And I want to read to you one story from Calvin's life in which he had to face the bloodthirstiness of the Libertines with great courage and faith. The Council of Geneva was assembled. Never had any session been more tumultuous. The parties, weary of speaking, tired of arguing with each other, frustrated, began to appeal to arms. Let's quit talking. It's time for guns. The people heard the appeal. Calvin appears, unattended, without any bodyguards now. He's received at the lower part of the hall with cries of death, people cheering, kill Calvin. Here's a sickly little man. He folds his arms, looks the agitators fixedly in the face. Not one of them dares strike him. Then calmly walking through the midst of this rebel, this uh, group of, of violent people, with his breast uncovered, his shirt opened, he says, now here's this crowd, they're ready to draw swords, they're crying out for Calvin's death, sickly little guy in the middle, tears open his shirt and says, you want blood? There's still a few drops here. Strike. Not an arm is raised. Calvin then slowly ascends the stairway that leads to the council chamber. The hall was on the point of being drenched with blood. Swords were drawn and flashing. When people saw the reformer, the weapons were lowered. And a few words sufficed to calm the agitation. Calvin, taking the arm of one of the council members, again descends the stairs and cried out to the people that he wished to address them. He spoke and with such energy and feeling that tears flowed from their eyes while their swords were hanging down. The crowd embraced each other, crying on each other's necks, and left in silence. The patriots, secret Catholics, and libertines had lost the day. From that moment on, it was easy to foretell that victory would remain with the reformer. That's what Calvin had to deal with from the libertines. Now the Anabaptists. Now, don't identify the Anabaptists with the Baptists of the United States. Baptists today make a mistake when they identify themselves with the Anabaptists of the 16th century. No Baptist in his right mind should ever want to be identified with these birds. It was a mixed crowd. I want to tell you some of the things these Anabaptists, Anna means against, uh, again, Anabaptists, they believe in baptizing people all over again because they didn't believe that certain other Christian baptism counted. This was a mixed group of radical reformers. They weren't Roman Catholic and they weren't reformed. They included revolutionaries who wanted to overthrow any kind of social order. They included people who believed in the inner light. That is, you don't need the word of God. God will just tell you what to believe. They were pacifists. They didn't believe in self-defense or in war. They didn't believe Christians could, they believed Christians could not hold office. They believed that Christians couldn't take oaths. They believed that Christians could not use the courts and judges. They were communists, by the way. They were real communists. They built communities based upon the common ownership of property. They were docetists. That is, they didn't believe that Jesus was really human. They were rapturists, which was also a new thing, waiting for Jesus to come and rapture them out of the thing and immediately set up his kingdom. And whenever they did take over some place and set up an Anabaptist kingdom, like at Münster, Germany, they would pass unbelievable laws. They took over Münster, Germany, and they passed a law making it a communist state. They required the, the shared ownership and common ownership of property. They passed a law uh, legalizing polygamy. And they also, to show their freedom in Christ, decided that it was proper for everybody to run through the, na the streets naked to show that they were not under any law but under grace. <clears throat> 
Now, I'll tell you, Baptist friends, do not identify with this bunch. There's, there, there's no connection, very little connection. So Calvin had to deal with that group. Then there was a third source of opposition, and of course that was the Roman Catholic hierarchy. The Pope, the Cardinals, the Bishops, the hierarchy, not the people, but the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. And you know the, the basic arguments. The concern was the authority of the Church versus the authority of God, which is over which. Is the authority of the church over the word of God or is the word of God over the authority of the church? Is there another authority in the church beside the word of God or is the word of God, sola scriptura, the only authority? Is the gospel a gospel of grace or a gospel of works and of merit and of sacraments and of rites and of penance and of indulgences and of making points with God? He, without hesitation, would refer to the Pope and the Roman Catholic hierarchy who, in his mind, had corrupted the church as the Antichrists. And there were many details about Roman Catholicism that he repudiated. One was that the Pope is the head of the church on earth. Two, that the Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra, uh, speaks infallibly. He was particularly repulsed, and all these are still Roman Catholic doctrines. He was repulsed to the Roman Catholic doctrine of the Mass. That is, on the altar, that's what, they, that's what altars are for. We don't have altars in this church. No Protestant church would have an altar. Any Protestant church that has something in the front it calls an altar shows its influence at Rome. On altars you sacrifice things, and so you hear about the sacrifice of the Mass. And it is Roman Catholic doctrine that every time Mass is performed, Christ is crucified all over again, sacrificed all over again, instead of believing that once for all he obtained eternal redemption for us. Roman Catholicism teaches that when the communion is taken, that the bread becomes literal flesh of Christ and the wine becomes literal blood of Christ, and that salvation is to be confined to the institutional Roman Catholic Church, and the seven sacraments are required, and the whole issue is one of making points with God so that you don't have to burn in purgatory for several million years before you go to heaven. I mean, there's nothing hopeful about it. If you're outside the Roman Catholic Church, you go to hell. If you're inside the Roman Catholic Church, you go to heaven after, hopefully, after you spend several million years burning in the fires of purgatory, getting you ready for heaven after you die. Real hopeful. Well, obviously, these are things Calvin opposed. Now, Servetus. i got to mention Servetus. Everybody knows about Servetus, right? Anybody in here hadn't heard about Servetus in public schools or high schools? Everybody knows that Calvin burned Servetus. Everybody knows in every public school in the world that John Calvin burned uh, Servetus at the stake. Well, that's not the case. But you need to know about Servetus. Servetus was born Miguel Serveto in Spain in somewhere around 1509 or 1511. He was a vicious anti-Trinitarian. He wrote books attacking the Trinity. He says that people who believe in the Trinity are polytheists. They're saying there's more than one God. Uh, he, he would strip the Bible. He helped edit uh, an edition of the, of, of the Latin Bible in which he stripped the Old Testament of all prophecies that relate to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was condemned as a heretic of the worst sort by both the Roman Catholics and the Protestants, and everybody wanted his head. Everybody. The whole Christian world saw him as an outlaw and a capital criminal, whether they were Roman Catholics or Protestants. Calvin tried to witness to him all his life. All through his ministry, Calvin would send letters to him trying to get Servetus to come to his house so he could witness to him. At one point, Servetus responded that he was going to show up at a certain day, but he never, never, never responded, never showed up. You could, can't help but imagine about what would happen had he met Calvin. But he was a cocky man, too. By the way, he was famous in science. Do you know he was the first man ever to chart the venal arterial system of the body? That is Servetus. Made fun of the Trinity and of Trinitarian views was a cocky rascal. Why in the world a man like Servetus would come to a place like Geneva, I'll never know. I mean, here Geneva was a hotbed of Trinitarian Calvinism. Here was the outlaw that everybody, whose head everybody wanted. And what does he do? But he shows up in Geneva, Switzerland while Calvin's there. Now, the only reason I can possibly think for this arrogant guy to do such a foolish thing was because he was hoping to challenge Calvin to a public debate and once and for all refute and discredit him right in his home, uh, home turf. Who knows? Anyway, he was arrested, and he was carefully, patiently, and justly tried in court, found guilty of teaching heresy, and on October the 26th, 1533, was sentenced to death by the Geneva Council by being burned alive. 
Calvin had pled with the town fathers time and again to change the way they were dealing with Servetus in his trial. And after he was sentenced to being burned alive, Calvin got other ministers with him to try to convince the political authorities not to execute Servetus by burning, but to execute him by quicker, less painful death, such as beheading. But the council refused. Now, the reason I'll tell you all that is to make the point that in the trial and conviction and sentencing and burning of Servetus, John Calvin would not decide one single detail. He did believe, and properly so, along with the whole Christian world of that day, that the propagation of heresy was a capital crime. Sometime look up Leviticus 24.16. Let me read you this quote about Servetus. Christians believe that heresy is an attempt to misdirect God's plan, and Servetus was more than a simple heretic. He was a scholar who, while pretending to be a Christian, attacked the foundations of Christianity. He was a dangerous enemy of the faith. Left unchecked, Servetus would have unhinged both the Reformation and Catholicism and left Europe bereft in the ashes of its faith centuries before that situation was actually realized. The confrontation between Calvin and Servetus, therefore, was one of the high moments of history. Heavy with not simply earthly, but eternal significance. People refer to Calvin, and maybe you've learned this. I'm sure you learned this in public school. If you hadn't, you weren't listening when your teacher taught this part of history. Everybody knows of Calvin as the dictator of Geneva. Well, Calvin never ruled in Geneva. Never ruled. Never held a political office. The city of Geneva was not a totalitarian society. It was a republic. It had elections. It had opportunities for dissent and disagreement. Calvin held no public office. He could not arrest anybody. He couldn't punish any citizen. He couldn't appoint or dismiss any public official. And to say that he was the dictator of Geneva is pure slander. He died May the 27th, 1564. In his last days, although his voice was broken with asthma and his body racked with pain, he prayed this prayer. You are bruising me, O Lord, but it is enough for me that it is your hand. He lived to be, in those days, an old, 54 years old, and left behind him a model of Reformed Church based on the law of Moses and the gospel of Christ, a flourishing school which was the nursery of evangelical preachers, and a library of books from his own pen which after four or five centuries still influenced people's minds. His best friend with whom we began this message this evening, Theodore Beza, said this about his death. When Calvin died, thus withdrew into heaven that most brilliant star, which was the lamp of the church. On the following night and day, there was immense grief and lamentation in the whole city, for the republic had lost its wisest citizen, the church, its faithful shepherd, the academy, an incomparable teacher, all lamented the departure of their common father and best comforter next to God. And Calvin was buried in a simple grave with a small marker inscribed only with the initials J.C. Toward the end of his life, he reviewed his own life. And he said these words as he was dying, and he knew he was dying. I am quite different from other sick people, he said. When they come near their end, their senses fail and they become delirious. But it seems as if God wants me to concentrate all my inward senses. He remained sharp and lucid to the very end. He watched death appear and knew when it bent down and touched him. At 8 o'clock in the morning, May the 27th, 1564. So died the man who gave the evangelical movement its theology, whose principles were those of Augustine and Luther, and whom Warfield considered the creator of the Protestant church in its freedoms. No Christian leader has ever been so often condemned by so many people as John Calvin. And the usual grounds for condemnation are the execution of Servetus and the doctrine of predestination. Predestination. 
Yet Servetus was only one of tens of thousands who went to their deaths in Calvin's time, and none of their judges ever received the denunciations heaped upon Calvin, who had no civil authority and was not a judge in Geneva. Men of the 20th century who have witnessed without moving a finger the arbitrary murder of tens of millions have no ground upon which to stand and judge John Calvin. Perhaps it is because of his doctrine of predestination and the sovereignty of God that so many teeth have been set on such sharp edge. Calvin made clear what every man fears. A sovereign God cannot be escaped. Genevans put his body on display after his death. And the processions grew so long that they began to fear they would be accused of creating a saint. They stopped the processions and buried Calvin on Sunday, May the 28th, in a common cemetery without a tombstone, just as he requested. Time would prove that he wouldn't need a tombstone. Let us pray. Father, we do thank you for the great work of God, the work of your spirit in the Protestant Reformation. And we thank you for the standard bearer of that Reformation, John Calvin. In the name of Christ, amen.